Good morning. I'm happy to be here with you this morning to share recent updates in the management of breast cancer. I have no disclosures. It was an exciting year in breast cancer. There are several new studies um, presented at major meetings over the last year. Findings from these studies have the potential to change current practice standards. Specifically, I'll be talking about results from ATLAS and ADAM, which impact on hormone sensitive disease. I'll also be discussing the results from Amelia and Bolero 3, which um, impact on the management of HER2 new positive breast disease. But I wanted to start with a brief history of tamoxifen therapy. It was 30 years ago that the Novodex adjuvant trial presented follow-up information on two years of adjuvant tamoxifen used in the post-metastatic post-mastectomy state for early stage breast cancer. Subsequent interim analysis continued to support the positive findings of using adjuvant tamoxifen. And two years, as well as five years of adjuvant therapy was the standard of care until 1996. That year, the Swedish trial demonstrated the superiority of five years of tamoxifen over two years in the postmenopausal patient. Another major study involving tamoxifen therapy was the NSABP P1 prevention trial. This is one of the largest trials conducted to date looking at the use of tamoxifen. In this study, women who were um, termed high risk based on the Gale model were randomized to either five years of tamoxifen or five years of placebo. And they were looking at the um, effect on the incidence of breast cancer. This study was initiated in 1992 and results were published in 1998. What was significant about this study was that the five years of tamoxifen did decrease the incidence of both invasive and non-invasive cancer in the women who took the, the chemopreventive agent. So five years, this added more support to using tamoxifen as adjuvant therapy. So five years of tamoxifen was the standard of care for a couple of decades until 2000 when the results of ATAC were published. And ATAC looked at aromatase inhibitors in postmenopausal women and demonstrated the superiority of aromatase inhibitors as compared to tamoxifen in, in postmenopausal females. And then in 2005, we have the results of MA17. And this looked at extending hormonal therapy in postmenopausal females. These women had taken tamoxifen for at least four and a half years and then were followed up with five years of letrozole. And this study did show an improvement in disease-free survival in the women who took the 10 years of therapy as compared to the women who only had the five years of tamoxifen. Um, this also showed a, a trend towards overall survi sur survival in women who were node positive. Nevertheless, despite these advances in hormonal therapy, late recurrence continues to be a problem for hormone-positive disease. Women can recur 10, 20, 30 years post their initial diagnoses. Safner et al. did an um, analysis of the recurrence of the hazard of recurrence and looking at seven ECOG trials, more than 3,500 women, and noted that more than half of the recurrences happened in the five years after the therapy had, had ceased. This uh, effect was also noted in the 10-year analysis of the ATAC trial. And the Early Breast Cancer Trialist Collaborative Group reported on the 10 and 15-year effects of adjuvant therapy, the effect on recurrence and mortality. And what was significant about this meta-analysis, they looked at 194 trials. They were unconfounded. And they noted a significant carryover effect from the initial five years of therapy. This effect extended 10 years post the cessation of tamoxifen therapy with reduction in both recurrence and mortality. So the question of whether continuing tamoxifen therapy would be helpful has been studied in, in several smaller studies. The ECOG trial had 194 patients, and that did suggest that tamoxifen therapy would be advantageous for up to 10 years. But the Scottish adjuvant trial and the NSABP14 both have negative results. But now, with the results of ATLAS, this question has finally been answered. 
Atlas was an international trial that recruited women from 36 countries. The eligibility criteria included women who had a history of breast cancer. All of their disease had to have been removed and they had to be clinically free of disease at trial entry. They were either still on therapy or had finished therapy within the year prior and could easily resume treatment. And, certain, and uncertainty should exist as to whether there was any benefit of continuing tamoxifen therapy. So more than 15,000 women were, were randomly allocated. They lost more than 2,000 because they had only taken tamoxifen for four years or less. They lost another 6,000 because it turned out they were ER negative or their ER status was unknown, which left 6,846 women to be analyzed for the, the main effects of um, breast cancer recurrence and mortality. Atlas findings were presented at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium in December of last year at an eight-year median follow-up, and they reported on compliance, recurrence, and death. Recurrence was defined as the first recurrence, either the, the, a new tumor or the same tumor. It could be distant, local, regional, or contralateral. And Atlas did find a absolute reduction in recurrence of 3.7% and an absolute reduction in mortality of 2.8%. They also noted a, 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 de, a reduction in overall mortality, and compliance across the board was about 80%. Another finding that was um, significant was that there was a little effect seen during years five through nine. Uh, in terms of breast cancer death rates, but then the, the rate dropped after year 10. <coughs> Subgroup analysis, whether it was by age or tumor diameter or postmenopausal status, geographic region, all subgroups favor the 10-year cohort with a risk ratio less than one in all subgroups. The investigators only had access to toxicities related to hospitalization or death, but as expected, in the 10-year cohort, there was more um, incidences of pulmonary embolism and endometrial cancer. Nevertheless, these findings were significant enough that they have changed current practice standards and are now included in the NCCN guidelines. For premenopausal women um, at diagnosis who complete five years of tamoxifen therapy and remain premenopausal at the year, end of that five year, it's now recommended that we consider an additional five years of therapy. And that's a category one recommendation. And for women who are postmenopausal at diagnosis, who maybe have a contraindication to an aerobitase inhibitor or don't like the side effects, um, they're recommending tamoxifen for up to 10 years. So Atlas, the ADAM was the sister trial to Atlas. ADAM was also a phase three randomized study. It enrolled nearly 7,000 women from the UK, and the purpose was to um, assess reliably the benefits and risk of, of prolonging adjuvant tamoxifen therapy. It had similar inclusion criteria to the Atlas. Um, any woman who had complete excision of their breast carcinoma, they could have any primary treatment needed to be clinically relapse-free of disease at trial entry, and uncertainty um, existing about the benefit of continued therapy. So the combined objectives of Adam and Atlas were to randomize at least 20,000 women. They fell a little short, but they also wanted to re reliably detect or refute a 2 to 3 percent improvement in survival. And then they also needed to follow these women for up to 15 years, as, as you've seen in the previous slide, the carryover effect of tamoxifen can last for up to a decade. So they needed to follow these women for a long time. But Adam as well showed an absolute reduction in recurrence and an absolute reduction in breast cancer mortality. As in Atlas, there was no benefit seen until year 10. There is no difference seen in death without recurrence, and overall mortality, no difference has been observed yet. So in summary, these data combined from Adam and Atlas support extending tamoxifen therapy beyond five years, but it's particularly useful in women who are premenopausal. We can extrapolate from this data to aromatase inhibitors. Those studies are still ongoing. But it does speak to what we uh, still need to find out about the biology of this disease. And further research studies should focus on um, 
perhaps identifying markers of late recurrence and of course improving strategies for these females. So moving on to HER2 new positive disease, about 20% of all breast cancers are HER2 new positive. There have been a number of new therapies approved over the last couple of years. And with so many therapies to choose from, it can become challenging to decide which drug to use first, which combination of drugs to use, and how to sequence these therapies. Trastuzumab was first on the scene. It was approved in 1998 by the FDA for use in combination with taxanes for metastatic HER2 new positive disease. It mediates its effect by binding to the extracellular component of the HER2 protein. The HER2 protein is part of a superfamily of, of HER2 receptors. There's HER1, HER2, 3, and 4. And HER2 is kind of the orphan receptor because there's no known ligand. But um, in the mutated HER2, it um, constitutively dimerizes, and it dimerizes with, it, with its co-receptors, and it's this dimerization that initiates phosphorylation of the tyrosine kinase, and then initiates signaling through the cellular pathway. So when trastuzumab binds, it interrupts this ligand independent complex and interrupts that pathway. So as I mentioned, trastuzumab was approved in 1998 for use in metastatic disease. It has since gained approval for adjuvant therapy, and we use it routinely in the adjuvant setting, Herceptin, for our HER2-positive females. Pertuzumab was just approved last year. It's also a humanized monoclonal antibody that binds to the extracellular component, but it binds at a different epitope compared to the trastuzumab. And TDM1 was just approved this year. It's an antibody drug conjugate that binds um, through the antibody portion to the extracellular component, and then the um, cytotoxic component gains entry into the cell to mediate its effect. Lapatinib is a dual oral kinase inhibitor, and it works intracellularly. And aratinib and afatinib are two new agents that are under clinical trials right now. But all of these therapies work to inhibit cell growth and differentiation and survival of the, the malignant cell. It was in November of last year that the results of Amelia were published. And this was a phase three clinical trial that led to the approval of TDM1 or adotrastuzumab. And um, this is the first antibody drug conjugate in clinical trials that has this non-reducible thioether linker. And that's important because it makes this, um, an this antibody drug conjugate more efficient and less toxic, which is very important for our patients who um, many times have seen lots of therapy by the time they get to trastuzumab. So, so in Amelia, TDM1 was compared to capecitabine and lapatinib. Uh, it was a phase three one-to-one -one randomization. The key inclusion criteria were that women had to have had taxane or trastuzumab in the adjuvant or the metastatic setting, and disease progression needed to be documented. So um, TDM1 is an IV therapy given every three weeks. Lapatinib and capecitabine are both oral therapies. Lapatinib was given daily, and capecitabine is given days one through four, 14, an acute 21-day cycle. Primary endpoints were overall survival, progression-free survival and safety, and a secondary endpoint was quality of life. So here we have the Kaplan-Meier curve showing the progression-free survival, and it does favor TDM1, 3.2 months more than lapatinib and capecitabine. That's a significant finding. And then at the 18-month interim um, analysis for overall survival, again, TDM1 was favored over lapatinib, 30 months compared to 25 months, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.68. The adverse events were as expected from what we know about these drugs. There were more diarrhea, palmar plantar erythrodysesthesia, and vomiting in the lapatinib and capecitabine arm and more liver toxicity with elevated ALT and AST, as well as more thrombocytopenia in the TDM1 arm. Trastuzumab resistance is a known phenomenon. We don't, we're not quite sure why it happens, but because it does happen, it necessitates the continued development of new therapies. 
So Bolero 3 was looking at Averolimus in combination with trastuzumab and venerelbine as an option for these females. It's clinical and um, preclinical and clinical phase one and two trials have indicated that adding a virulimus to trastuzumab can help restore the sensitivity uh, of that drug and improve efficacy. So another look at the um, intracellular pathway. We know that these malignant cells overexpress HER2, which dimerizes. And then we have phosphorylation of the tyrosine kinase that initiates cell signaling through these pathways, both RAS, RAF, MEK, and ERK and more importantly, through PI3 kinase, AKT, and mTOR. So if we can block mTOR, which Averolimus does, we can inhibit protein synthesis and hence inhibit survival and angiogenesis of these malignant cells. So here's one of the phase one trials that um, Bolero 3 built on, and this is a very small study, 27 patients. But I want to draw your attention to the overall response rate. It's quite impressive. Even though it was a small study, it was 44%. And then in the taxane and trastuzumab resistant um, patients, 55%. And the clinical benefit rate is defined by CR or PR or stable disease of 74%. And another phase one trial, which provided the proof of concept for Bolero 3 used the same regimen that was tested in Bolero 3, Averolimus, Trastuzumab, and Venorelbing. Overall response rate was not quite as robust, but it's respectable in the heavily treated population. 60% disease stabilization and a 50% clinical benefit rate. So here you have the study design of Bolero 3, and it was a randomized phase three, as mentioned, one to one. And 572 patients enrolled. These patients should have had prior taxane and um, trastuzumab resistance uh, was defined as progression on or within 12 months of trastuzumab or metastatic progression within 12 months of trastuzumab. Two arms, the virulimus was given at a dose of five milligrams daily, venereal being at 25 milligrams per meter squared weekly and trastuzumab two milligrams per kilogram weekly, and then the placebo arm. These patients were treated until disease progression or intolerable toxicity with the endpoints of primary um, or progression-free survival. A lot of secondary endpoints, overall survival, overall response rate, time to deterioration of ECOG performance status, which is very important because when we're treating um, these patients with metastatic disease and they're getting third-line therapy or fourth-line therapy want to maintain their quality of life, um, safety, duration of response, and clinical benefit rate. So they enrolled patients from 159 centers in 21 countries. And at analysis of progression-free survival, the benefit was seen in the virulimus over placebo, seven months compared to 5.78 months, hazard ratio of 0.78. And subgroup analysis also favored virulimus in general. There are a few exceptions, most notably women greater than age 65, um, patients who had not had any prior adjuvant or neoadjuvant trastuzumab, and also ER positive, PR positive patients did not do quite as well. In terms of side effects, unfortunately, there were more side effects seen in the virulimus arm, stomatitis 63 compared to 28, pyrexia 39 compared to 23, um, decreased appetite 33 compared to 17, and then in terms of hematologic toxicities, more pronounced um, across the board in the Averolimus arm, 81 compared to 70, 49, 29, and so on. Overall survival at the cutoff date in March of, 20, of 2013, 220 deaths were recorded, 36.3 in the Averolimus arm and 41 in the placebo arm. The on-treatment deaths were balanced between the arms and the deaths due to adverse events were balanced. Final survival analysis will be conducted after 384 deaths. 
They also did an evaluation looking at um, quality of life, and it was noted that there was no difference between the two arms of the hazard ratio of 0 0.98. Deterioration was defined as greater than 10% from baseline. So in summary, the addition of verilimus to trastuzumab and venorelbine does prolong progression-free survival in this trastuzumab-resistant and taxane-pretreated patient population, reducing the risk of disease progression or death by 22%. The adverse effects were consistent with what we know about Averilimus and, and its use in breast cancer. Even though there were more adverse events in the Averilimus arm, it did not seem to impact the quality of life. Although the interim overall survival data are not yet mature, there were fewer deaths in the Averilimus arm. So this was the first phase three trial that looked at using um, verilimus and blocking the mTOR pathway in HER2 new positive disease. So this does establish this regimen as a viable option for these patients and could be considered um, in our treatment regimens. Bolero 1 is an ongoing study. Well, actually, it just closed, but we're waiting for the evaluation of the Bolero 1, which is looking at Averilimus first line therapy in the metastatic setting in combination with trastuzumab and taxane. So, to answer the question of how do we sequence these drugs, with the caveat of um, these recommendations are for patients who do not have any known, known. Um, brain metastases. These drugs have not been studied extensively in patients who have brain metastases with the exception of lapatinib and the, there is some clinical trial data that does um, signify that lapatinib does have an effect in positive brain mets. But for patients who are trastuzumab sensitive, that means they've never seen trastuzumab or the last time they saw trastuzumab was greater than a year ago. Um, the combination of docetaxel, trastuzumab, and pertuzumab is recommended as first-line therapy, and this is based on results from Cleopatra, and that was a phase three clinical trial that was published last year. TDM1 is now recommended as second-line therapy based on the results of Amelia, and the investigators of Bolero 3 feel that the Averilimus, venorelbine, and trastuzumab arm is a viable third-line option. And then um, now we have fourth line and fifth line with lapatinib and capecitabine, lapatinib and trastuzumab. For those women for whom trastuzumab sensitivity is in doubt, it's recommended that we start with a non-trastuzumab containing regimen. TDM1 followed by lapatinib and capecitabine, and then introduce trastuzumab and third or fourth line therapy as clinically indicated. But we do have some late breaking news. On Monday of last week, our hardworking colleagues at the FDA granted accelerated approval to pertuzumab for use in the neoadjuvant setting. This is the first FDA drug that's been approved for neoadjuvant use, even though we've been using therapies um, for years kind of off, offline uh, in the neoadjuvant setting. And this drug has the FDA approval. And this was based on results of Neosphere, which is a phase two trial that looked at a, a pathologic CR in patients receiving trastuzumab-based therapy. And they had a 39% CR as compared to the um, non-trastuzumab-containing arm. So the accelerated approval is contingent on results of Affinity, which is an adjuvant trial looking at trastuzumab. And that was just closed, I believe, this summer. Another significant finding were the results of Teresa, and that was presented at the European Cancer Congress, and that was another phase three trial that looked at the use of TDM1 in combination with any chemotherapy of choice, and showed an improvement in progression-free survival, nearly double compared to the arm that did not have TDM1. So this gives more support to the findings that we saw in Amelia. So this is really a um, dynamic field of study, and hopefully we'll continue to make many advances for these patients. So thank you for your attention.